Good morning, guys, and welcome to the podcast. Today, I've got Jira Golden. She's the founder and CEO of Direct Source Wealth. She's got over 20 years of experience in real estate investing. She's got a portfolio, and I'm really happy to have her on the show to discuss real estate. So, Kira, welcome. Thank you. Excited to be here. Yeah. So, you briefly introduce yourself to the audience, and wow. um, we'll get started. Sure. So, I've been doing real estate since I was 18 years old. I grew up watching Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad on infomercials back when people had big, deep TVs in their houses and started as soon as I could sign a contract buying real estate. And so I've done everything in the space that, that I could think of. I've done fix and flips, private lending. I owned a mortgage bank, commercial real estate, industrial warehouses, hotel hospitality, significant Airbnb portfolio. Um, so fully diversified and uh, geographically diversified. So I've done real estate deals in Europe, uh, South America, Caribbean, obviously the United States. So just been really focused on providing our co-investors with a, a, a focused series of investment theories that allow them to create a diversified investment portfolio. And then about Three years ago, I started buying companies. I own a tax strategy firm that specializes in getting six figures of savings for business owners, tax savings. We don't usually go for anything lower than a six-figure tax savings and an insurance company, as well as a fractional interest in a broker-dealer and full ownership of an RIA. So created a, a suite of financial services where real estate is the anchor, but we do everything in the real in the investment space at this point. Yeah, really interesting. And we'll go into um, the questions. And first thing is about your walking us through the process of building your first real estate investment to managing a portfolio. What are some pivotal moments or decisions that contributed to your success? Oh, that's such a good question. Number one, I would say the first pivotal moment was think in my case, I was lucky because I was so young. I was able to overcome the inertia of the initial risk, right? Because if, if it's your first time moving into that space, it can, you can think of all the things that could go wrong. And I remember thinking, okay, but I'm 18. So let's say I do this. I screw it all up. I lose everything by the time I'm 30 and I start all over at 30. That's before most people still even start in the first place. I was able to Go ahead and take additional risk, I think, because of that. Now, if I were to start out at this point, I'm in my 40s, I would probably not do it the same way where I just jumped in and learned through trial and error. I would work with somebody who's experienced, which means I'm going to make a little less returns, but I'm going to make less mistakes. But at the time, that was really uh, an advantage for me was the fact that I had so much time. Um, the next big pivotal moment was 2000 to 2006, I was buying real estate. And many of you probably know in 2006, we started to have a market correction. And by 2008, we were in a full-blown great recession, I believe it was called. And then real estate was significantly impacted by that, especially single family residential, which was the bulk of my portfolio at the time. And I'm very proud to say that I didn't lose a single property. I didn't have a single foreclosure. I had many properties like many other investors that I had bought for six figures that the comps in the neighborhood were now trading for four and five figures. <laughs> so I had $160,000 mortgage on a property that the property across the street was selling for $35,000. And it had an extra bedroom and a pool compared to my property. But I would say a next, the next pivotal decision was, and it formed my long-term thinking, I am a long-term investor. I'm not a speculator. So do I believe that real estate will eventually recover? Yes. And so instead of like many people who handed my cash, my keys to the bank, it said, I'll never recover from this. It's too far down. I kept going. I kept paying my mortgages and I bought as much other stuff as I could when the market was down, right? So my thinking is if you believe in the product, and the market takes a downturn, and I'll relate this to what I've been doing in crypto too. If you believe in the product and the market takes a downturn, you double down. You don't run away. You have to have an iron stomach to do what we did. So, and of course, fortunately, the real estate market bounced back, and those properties are now worth two times what they were when I bought 
them. That's another pivotal moment. And then I would say the third pivotal moment was when I realized the power of scale and partnership. So it was 2013 is when I started work really actively working with co-investors and starting to do $20 million deals, $50 million deals, and now $100 million deals because we can make a lot more money much more efficiently when we work together. That's a great segue. And the first question I have for you is, so when you talk about these early beginnings, then one thing I have a question for you is that a lot of people are interested, like we're coming towards the end of this and we, you know, with recent interest rate drops, where do you see, how does the real estate market compare to 2008? Because I know a lot of multifamily and uh, I know commercial struggling. So talk about comparisons with 2008 and also where you see the uh, market headed or which sectors to, to really focus on? Yeah, great. So some context on my comments I'm about to give. Number one, I invest with a 300 plus year time horizon. I invest so my grandkids and your grandkids are going to own a lot of assets together and have an incredible lifestyle. I do not invest so that in six months or a year, I meet a certain objective. And this gives me a lot of power in negotiating through market cycles. So when markets get a little cattywampus, it's an opportunity for me instead of a fear factor, right? Because if you've got a 300 year time horizon, then the thinking becomes, I just wanna get chips on the table that are gonna change my family's course of the legacy that I'm building. I'm not obsessively focused on what's happening next quarter. Having said that, we don't ignore those things, right? So you pointed out some really important context, contextual things. What's going on right now with interest rates? Are they going to go back up? Are they going to keep coming back down? What's happening with, quote, the real estate market? So let's tease that out. The real estate market after 2008 was an entirely different market than it was before. Prior to 2008, the market moved like this. And I'm on a video, so I don't know if everyone on a podcast can hear me. My hands are moving up in this unison and down in unison, right? It moved as a class. Real estate and multifamily went up, went down. Single family went up, went down nationally. Didn't matter if you were in California, Wyoming, South Carolina, New York City. Now, yes, real estate in New York, California, Seattle was always more expensive than real estate in Tennessee or Ohio, but they moved together. After 2008, the market became fragmented. So sub markets move very differently. And politics have had a really big impact on which markets move in which directions, red states, blue states, purple states. In addition, there's this other factor that I find fascinating, which is I call it the guru factor. So there's a lot of real estate gurus who were in the single family market leading up to 2008. There were a lot of people who, like me, had read Rich Dad, Poor Dad and other resources and started investing. So these were not people who were professional investors who cut their teeth and grew up in the space or had families who were in the business. They read a book, maybe took a $20,000 course or nowadays a $50,000 course and took a stab at investing. And the, the, the real answer is that all of us, having read a course, not read a course, are going to make a lot of mistakes the first 10 years. And so when there's a lot of people in a particular investment vertical making a lot of mistakes, that impacts the entire asset class. So that was happening in single family, but it wasn't really happening in multifamily back in 2008. So in 2008, multifamily didn't take the same hit that single family did. Now, as we're going into this in interest rate recession, there are a lot of multifamily investors and gurus, people who've been in our space for less than 10 years, and they are getting, can I say a bad word on your podcast? They're getting their asses handed to them right now, right? Because they did stupid things that they didn't know any better. And, uh, and I'll tell you what those stupid things were. They did adjustable rate mortgages, just like they did back in 2008 on their single family portfolios. <laughs> These are, they had adjustable rate mortgages. They had short time horizons. Hey, I'm going to get in. The property is going to double in three years. I'm going to get out. I'm a genius because that happened. That happened for a period of almost a decade. So they just thought they were geniuses. They didn't realize in the larger context of the industry that this was just a, a moment, right? 
And so they they told their investors, hey, we're going to be in and out in three years, and then they can't get out. And if they structured their offerings where they have to get out in three years, they don't have any flexibility to continue, then they have to sell at a loss because their contracts require it, right? So that's happening. So instead of being able to ride it out, we refinanced, I'd say 90% of our portfolio was refinanced at 3% and below interest rates for 10 years or more. I got I took as much 10-year Freddie and 35-year HUD money as we could get on our assets. We're just riding through this and we're just seeing it as a buying opportunity. So we're taking the cash flow and the value we can take out of our assets and buying aggressively. The other big mistake people made is they were buying at the top of the market. So we stopped buying in 2020 and we didn't start buying again until last November. Um, so we waited, we held cash until the correction started to make its way through. And then I like to buy at the highest moments of confusion. So right when interest rates go up, right when rates come back down, because the market hasn't yet worked all that information in efficiently, sellers are scared, lenders are scared, investors are scared. And as our friend Warren Buffett says, when others are fearful, be greedy, right? So we apply that principle. Yeah, that's very well said. And it's interesting because I applied the same mentality post-2008 and everybody was losing their shirts and people told me I was crazy to be buying real estate at that time. And I just, I ignored them. And, but and yeah, and, and I think we have similar mindset than the long-term investor mindset rather than the short-term speculative mindset. One thing I want to ask you is the first thing is uh, trends. You mentioned you're, you invest in digital assets and and this is not financial advice and we're just talking and then, but a lot of, I speak to a lot of Gen Z and millennials. They are, they think that real estate is an, is an asset class for the baby boomers and Gen X and they, and especially with flooding, tornado, hurricane, you've got tenants and um, you have, I guess, really, it's just a high maintenance asset class. So they're like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna own a home. I'm gonna Airbnb my way around the world. I'm gonna have a digital business and I don't have to be locked into a mortgage and I, there's Bitcoin and there's, there's equities. So talk about this shift, this kind of shift in yeah. our mindset. I love this shift. This shift is why I'm going to be a multi-billionaire and probably you too. So it's so funny. I just, I have to tell in complete love and appreciation for these, this gen, this younger generation, but like now I'm part of the older generation. So I get to poke at them a little, right? So I remember being invited by a 20 year old to the to his house for dinner with some other 20 year olds I, i'm not sure exactly why i got invited but i got invited and he told me he's and everyone's gonna cook a little something and bring a dish so bring a salad or a dessert or something and we're gonna crowdsource dinner and i said crowdsource dinner i said like a potluck and he's what's that and he literally thought he invented the idea of crowdsourcing a meal I'm like, you guys are crazy. And when I hear things like, oh gosh, real estate, so many issues like floods. And I'm like, you mean going back to the time of Noah? Yeah, we've dealt with floods for a long time. We got this, right? It's not that complicated, people. But for some reason, there is this movement. But I love it. I embrace it. So part of our 300-year theory, and I'm just starting to talk more and more publicly about this, but I've been working on it for five years. And I only started to talk publicly because I, Sometimes I come from a, a multi-generation of thought leaders who sometimes scare the crap out of everyone around them because we're thinking 10, 15 years ahead, right? And people are like, ah, ah. but I, I've learned to hold back a little while. But I think the timing is ready, which is we're buying real estate assets. Not like none of the original reasons to buy real estate have gone away. They're all still there and they're all valid in my opinion. But now there's even more, which is as we move, to a tokenized society. So blockchain is not just about crypto co tokens or meme coins or frogs or grok or whatever. C crypto, cryptography, crypto, blockchain is about um, creating public ledgers, ideally decentralized ledgers that can facilitate liquidity in markets and make trading easier. And so in the same way, you can trade a fractional interest. In fact, most of the people listening to this podcast probably invest as LPs in syndications, which means 
they're already getting a fractionalized interest in an apartment complex. The only extra layer is to take that fractionalized interest and tokenize it, meaning use code to turn it into something that could trade easily on a blockchain. And then the last step of that is, and this is easier said than done, putting that out into the blockchain market. So all those people who want to be liquid, who don't want to own real estate or deal with any of the risk, they can buy a fractional interest, not just as an LP in an apartment complex as an investor, but get this, even in a community of apartment complexes across the world, so that as they move as a digital nomad, they don't have to fuss with Airbnb or find someplace. They could just say, hey, I'm part of the golden ecosystem of housing across the world. I have a fractional token interest. And as the real estate appreciates, I'm earning equity in the homes I get to live in. And they can spend two weeks in a house in Colorado, two weeks in a house in Puerto Rico, two weeks in a house on the Cote d'Azur as part of this ecosystem. And then if they don't like that ecosystem anymore, they could sell that token on the blockchain and buy something else. What this is going to do, let me pause there. Do, uh, questions, things to clarify in terms of what I think is happening there? No, it's just going to be, because it's interesting because what you're that thing it sounds like a time chair, but I'll let you finish. So yeah, <laughs> it, it is very, the old, again, there's nothing new under the sun. The only distinction between the timeshare and what I'm talking about is the blockchain aspect layered onto it. And the fact that you could now move through, let's say 10 or 15 timeshares, so, so to speak, by themselves. And, and I actually think if you went to my friend who crowdsourced dinner and said, hey, this is just a timeshare, he would be like, no, it's crypto blockchain real estate. And you're like, nope, still, it's potluck. That's been around forever. But, but the impact of this, what does this mean for us at, who are in the boomer generation and the Gen Z generation? It means that we have an opportunity, as I said before, to put chips on the table, to get the assets under our control. Because the interesting thing about owning nothing and being happy about it, which is essentially where this generation wants to go, is that as long as they get to use the assets, they've been conditioned to do everything on a use basis. They pay for software on a use basis. They don't even know that back in the day, we used to be able to buy our accounting software one time for a few hundred bucks and use it for 10 years. Right? Like they're used to paying every month. They didn't know that we used to go buy cars and then drive them with no, more, with no car payment for 10 years. They're used to Ubering or, or leasing a vehicle. And they're not gonna know that back in the day, we would buy a house pay it off and live in it for free. They're going to be used to paying every month for the rest of their lives, right? So what that does is it creates an opportunity for us who are with the times, who are willing to, instead of doing 12-year leases and things like that, to say, hey, you're going to get this fractional participation. And as long as you give us 60 days notice, you can move from asset B to asset C to asset Q. Just follow the process. And not only that, instead of renting from us, you can buy in with the blockchain. You can pay in crypto, ETH, SOL, and you can actually own a fraction. So as the value of the asset appreciates, you get to participate in that. So who makes all the money? And this has happened before. Again, nothing new under the sun. This whole revolutionary process happened to businesses back in 1914. And do you know what that was? I know 1913 was the Federal Reserve Act. But the 19th line that then always yeah. uh, what happened, happened? The first mutual funds were created. And now regular Joes were able to buy into companies in small fractions. And it was so revolutionary, just like blockchain. So revolutionary, right? And it is revolutionary, and it's also always been done before, right? It's just now it's being applied in a new lens, right? So when mutual funds happened and when ERISA opened up 401ks and individual investors started to be able to invest in securities and stocks, which, by the way, is now so commonplace and normal, but not that long ago, only the wealthiest, most elite could go buy a stock. You'd pay a $500 commission and you needed a seat at the stock exchange and you had to be able to buy. And even though the stock market existed and you could buy fractional interest in companies, you still had, it was still only for the most elite of the elite. And I would argue that real estate is in that same transitional space. You have to be 
an accredited investor. You have to be elite to be able to participate in that space. As blockchain moves into this space, then everyone's going to be able to buy a fractional interest. Yeah. So you can rent nine months out of the year and own three months out of the year if that's what you can afford out of college. And then you can rent six months out of the year and own six months out of the year. And then you can own nine months. So what, that, what does that leave? That leaves a problem that is also an opportunity. A problem is just an opportunity for or an oppor- a problem is just an opportunity for someone who sees it the right way. The problem is all these assets, whether it's an apartment complex or the car that everyone wants fractional interest in, or the picture of the banana that a hundred people own. Whoever actually has responsibility for the care and maintenance, the stewardship of that physical asset will be paid in perpetuity for maintaining it by all these people who have fractional interest, right? Because they're flying all over the world and they need to pay someone to monitor, maintain, and protect the value of that asset. The other thing is that when the stock market opened up and when things like E-Trade and Scott Trade and Ameritrade started to come out, think or swim, now a new investment theory came into play. So you're familiar with the efficient market theory? So in the stock market, the idea is the market is super efficient. So you're going to put your money in. You're just you're not going to pay anyone to advise you anymore because you can't outdo the market because it's so efficient. And so you put your money into the market and you just let it do its thing, right? Because it's so efficient. This will eventually happen to real estate. When this happens and the market becomes super efficient, who makes all the money? Who makes all the money in the stock market now? Who who will make all the money then? Who, who do you think? You're right. yeah. Oh, when it becomes really efficient, according, based on the efficient market hypothesis, it's going to be either the market makers or the people that get in early or people with access to information when the market becomes efficient. But uh, yeah, that's, mean, exactly right. the years. That, that's exactly what I would have said too. And hopefully for your listeners, they're in their car yelling out loud, the market makers, the early adopters, because th- that's, in my opinion, it's the right answer. So when, hopefully they're not in the gym, I just visualized someone in the gym on the treadmill listening to your podcast, yelling out while they're running in the gym on the treadmill. Anyway, I sorry, I have a funny brain. So here's the thing. I want to invite the co-investors who work with us to be those early adopters and to be those market makers. So what we're doing is, yes, we're out buying real estate, but we're out buying real estate because we eventually intend to tokenize that real estate and actually sell our interest in the equity, but maintain our interest as the market maker. So the way crypto works is that you set up a smart contract and that smart contract dictates if essentially for all time, if you think about Bitcoin. Once Bitcoin's contract was set, it's set. You don't get to go in and make a lot of tweaks, right? Version twos, version threes aren't really how that plays out, right? So you set the contract and you basically say, Chris and Kira and our friends are the market makers for 123 Main Street. We are the asset manager for 123 Main Street. We're going to make sure it's cleaned, painted, occupied, taxes are paid, insurance is paid. We're going to asset manage that for a fee to all the crypto blockchain equity owners, all the gen, what is it, gen Zers, gen Qers, I don't know, all, all the young people who are out there living the, the, their best life, digital nomading. So we're going to manage this for them. And every time they transact, when Joe decides to sell to Jill, there's going to be what they, in the crypto world they call a gas fee. Again, not new. Used to be called a transaction fee or a commission, right? Now they call it a gas fee. Same thing. When they pay that fee, it'll go to us. So every time somebody changes their mind or wants, so the, for the premium that they get of that liquidity and that freedom, that premium goes to the long players who have 300 year time horizons still. They're going to get to keep that premium, right? We're going to get to keep that premium. And it's not a scam. It's not a con. It's an arbitrage. It's we have a lens that is 300 years that is about stewarding assets for multiple generations and owning things. And they have a lens that's transactional and values flexibility, liquidity and freedom. And that's great because it creates a market. And that's what we're positioning for. So when we work with our co-investors, 
And again, I'm just starting to talk about this. Our PPMs don't reference it. Our operating agreements don't reference it. But I've been working behind the scenes with code writers and market makers. It's part of why we bought into the broker dealer is we were laying down the foundation to transition the portfolio into this direction, which we're now moving more aggressively in. Yeah, really fascinating discussion. And I want to pick your brain more. And I know the next guest is waiting. So how can people find you and uh, reach out to you? And uh, again, I would love to continue this conversation as a part two or webinar series. Yeah, I would love to come back and continue. I could talk about this all day long, but Direct Source Wealth is our website. Please don't judge us too harshly. I haven't updated it in about 15 years because I'm a 300-year time horizon person. <laughs> I forgot about it. But you can go to directsourcewealth.com. And you can also reach out to me. It's just my name, Kira, K-I-R-A, at directsourcewealth.com. And we've got webinars. We've got educational series. So we'd love to, yes, we like, let's not pull the punches. We want your podcast listeners to co-invest with us if they share our vision. But we also love educating. We love helping people see things, I think, in a clear way, maybe in a new way. So happy to connect and, and do that and continue talking and see if we can help some people. Yeah, excellent. And excellent ideas. These are kind of the newest. You're, you're the first guest that has actually talked about this efficient market with, with real estate. And thanks so much and keep up the one, absolutely wonderful work. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to spend time with you.